So first of all, I thought I'd start by just showing you what a human lumbar intervertebral disc, the source of all the problems, looks like. And this is a pretty normal disc. And one thing I want you to notice is how large it is. This is a centimeter scale. So this is the disc height, sort of over a centimeter in, um, in thickness, lying between the two bones of the spine. And this is the sort of diameter of the spine. This is the, the, the disc if you looked at it from the top. And it's really got two distinct regions. And this isn't a great sort of it's a picture of a disc, but the inner part of the disc is sort of softer and pulpy. The outer part of the disc, which is called the annulus, is called the annulus because it's made up of annular rings. And the disc looks, in this picture, as though it's a sort of rubbery material. But it's not a rubbery material. It's made up of a highly intricate network of biological molecules. And that's really what I want to talk to you about later on. But first, I just want to say, explain to you, or sort of remind you what the role of the discs are. The first is to act as a joint of the spine. If you didn't have discs, you would have a broomstick in your back. You wouldn't be able to turn, you wouldn't be able to bend or twist. The second thing that discs do is they carry really quite heavy loads because of principally muscles, not only body weight. And these have been measured inside the discs of volunteers. And there have been two studies where this has actually been done. And the first was done in the 1960s in Sweden with pressure measuring devices, which are shown down at the bottom here were actually inserted into the discs of volunteers, over a hundred of them. And then these volunteers were asked to take up different measurement, uh, different postures, and the pressures inside them were measured. Recently, much more recently, the study was repeated in Germany, but there they could only get permission to do it in two, page, two people, and they were both orthopedic surgeons, so they knew exactly what they were putting up themselves to. And the slide over here, actually it's not very clear, but here's the vertebral bodies, or the bones of the disc. This is the disc itself, and inside is this little pressure measuring device. And this is the sort of result they got. At the bottom here, this is a slide of the, one of the authors, Professor Wilker, and this is seconds. So this is naught to 10 seconds. This is the actual pressure. So this level of pressure is two atmospheres. That's about the level of pressure you have in a car tire. And what happened here, this person was lying down and he sneezed. So you can see the pressure rose really in his disc quite considerably for just a couple of seconds. And then he sneezed again and it rose even more. This other slide here is the results from the Swedish study of over 100 patients, or 100 subjects, I should say, volunteers. I believe they were medical students. I'm not sure about that. And really, what this shows is not dynamic, but the difference in pressure with different postures. Here's someone standing, here's someone lying down supine, here's someone sitting. The pressure's higher than when you're standing. If you're sitting, leaning forward, carrying a weight, the pressure may be 10 times as high as the pressure when you're lying down. Even when you're lying down, the pressure is high. It's again about two atmospheres, the pressure in the car tire. It can rise to 10 times or more, 20 times that, depending on what you do. So the discs have to put up with these very high pressures. Okay. How do they do that? <coughs> this is the type of pressure that you'd experience when you're lying down. This is a very disc, rather small, supported on a plastic here. This is the type of load that one of my students actually sort of set up in the laboratory, just showing you the type of load that your discs carry even when you're lying down, and while you're sitting here, but they're considerably higher than that. Okay, they are able to withstand this pressure because they're made of very strong material. And the major strength is provided by a protein called collagen, which you may have seen advertised as providing, I don't know why these slides are moving on their own, but anyway, you may have seen collagen advertised as smoothing your skin, but really it's, it's the scaffold of the body. It's the major structural protein in the body, and it forms a network and this is a sort of schematic from a rather beautiful pictures from this, these just Japanese group showing what the disc's collagen organization looks like. In the outer regions, the annulus, it forms these concentric layers, these lamellae, and they run clockwise and counterclockwise in a sort of slanting oblique direction in alternating lamellae. So they form an interwoven and reinforced network. And here they are showing you the different lamellae here, how they cross-weave, 
And this is looking from the top. This is a more detailed picture of these lamellae, just showing the beautiful organization of the lamellae and other proteins involved in, in a normal intervertebral disc, really beautifully organized. Okay, and this cross weave is actually used in other systems too. This comes from Professor Wilkie showing the cross woven um, organization in a car tire. And it's exactly the same. This is a schematic in a disc. I'm showing that it's gone. Here it is in a disc. Here's the disc sort of peeled apart to show these different lamellae with the cross weave, rather similar to, to a tire. So it gives a reinforcing, which enables the disc to, to withstand these very, very high pressures that it normally sees. And the disc is filled, not with air like a car tire, but with water. And that water is held in by another molecule. It's held in by a molecule which is a very large, branched molecule called agrican proteoglycan, and that molecule sucks in water, and that water is sucked in until the collagen tension is, um, is sort of set to its maximum. So basically, you need agrican, you need collagen to make the disc work, but you also need a whole lot of other molecules, and I won't even go through them, but these are just some of the other molecules that have been identified in the disc. So it's a very, very complex biological structure, beautifully organized to carry out its mechanical role. Okay. And this disc, of course, doesn't just arrive there. It's made by a very small population of cells. The cells are the factory of the disc. They are there making and maintaining the proteins, collagen, agrican, and all those other proteins throughout life. And the cells of the different regions of the disc are very different. The cells in the center of the disc are round, they make this rather disorganized, loose collagen network in the center. And all the other proteins that you see, especially the water, um, sucking up protein called agrican. The, the cells in the outside of the disc are long and thin, and they make this very beautifully organized lamella of the, of the animals. So they're made and maintained throughout life. But these cells also make enzymes, and these enzymes, which are proteases can actually break down all these molecules. So throughout life, the cells are making the molecules. They're also making enzymes which can break them down. And that's necessary because sometimes you want to get rid of a broken or degraded molecule. And so in a healthy disc, you have a balance. The rate at which the cells make all these molecules is balanced by the rate at which they are degraded. So you have a beautiful balance in the structure of the disc. What happens when you have a degraded disc? Well, this is what happens, I'm afraid. This is a picture of oh, degenerated discs. Obviously, doesn't want to sit there. So these are degenerate discs and normal discs. On the this side of the disc, there's a whole number of normal discs. And again, this comes from Professor Wilkie, who kindly gave me this slide. And here's a normal disc. You can see the high, highly hydrated nucleus. The annulus is rather organized. And then as the disc degenerates, things change. The disc becomes thinner. It loses hydration. Um, the nucleus is no longer so clear and marked. And then you start, as the disc degrades more, you start getting cracks, fissures. It loses translucency. You get spurs of bone formed. And in a very degenerate disc, you hardly see the disc at all. Big cracks in it, very thin. Sometimes it almost disappears. And I would like to sort of confirm, sort of reassure you that many people with discs like that feel absolutely fine. They don't even know that anything's wrong with their spine. So there's no, by no means a one-to-one -one correlation between disc degeneration and disc problems. However, it is much more likely that you will have disc problems if you have more degenerate discs. And that's why the thrust of research into the spine um, is, is sort of focused on disc degeneration. 